Here's innovation from Goyle that takes you further. New Goyle Super Synthetic 5W20 and 5W30 Lubes have been expertly crafted with the latest in liquid engineering technology, highly advanced for modern engines, prolongs oil change intervals, save you fuel, clean, protect and enhance engine performance. The way engines work has become complex and Goyle has innovated to stay ahead with expertly crafted lubricants that work excellently with all petrol and diesel engines of today. New Goyle Super Synthetic 5W20 and 5W30 News. Innovation that takes you further. Goyle. Good energy. Here's innovation from Goyle that takes you further. Oh yeah, Math 101. That was a long time ago, right? Did you enjoy it? All right. So, I want to talk about one of the first bits. Operations research. What is operations research? Now, it is a part of mathematics. Now, this part of mathematics is dealing with management, with industries, with companies. So you are a company, you have inputs and you have outputs, you have staff. Now, how do you maximize? How do you optimize your inputs, your time, to ensure that you have the maximum credit and, and, and profit? How do you work with the resources that you have there? Now, how do you compete with other industries? That is operations research. Now, one of the things there is what we call game theory. So, Let's assume that we have only two filling stations in Ghana, Goyal and Shell, or Goyal and a company B. Now, if we know that any decision that Goyal takes, company B would counter, and based on their counter, either Goyal gains or loses, then it becomes what we call a two-player game. I might win or lose based on the decision I take, and other company will do the same thing. If we can optimize these things, then of course, one person gets to win. Now, this, as I said, is in the managerial sciences, but I have a colleague in my office right now who is using that game theory to look at the interaction between cancer cells and cancer medication. So, this is the first one I want to talk about for us. Oh, sorry. So, there is this one. And for most of our students, seem to jump in onto this one because it says finance. It says money, right? So everybody goes money. Yeah, but this is another area of mathematics that has become very, very popular. Now, it works with math and stats, and it looks at this. So we have now Ghana, we have a lot of stock exchange um, commodities. I think gold is on it, right? So what happens then is that these people are looking at this. If we have a certain stock price, how does the stock price affect other derivatives of that commodity? Now, so here, because stock prices are not determ determined by default, because they change um, statistically or probabilistically, we need the probability guys also stepping in. So this one applies a part of math that we call stochastic differential equations. It is calculus, but then it adds probability to calculus. So come up with this. And these guys are in the stock market, the banks, and they're very widespread. Mathematical biology. We never thought math would be in biology, right? But math is in biology. Every time we talk about interrelations, we talk about math. Every time we talk about change, we talk about math. Every time we talk about accumulation, we talk about math. What is change? Change is differentiation. What is accumulation? It is integration. 
So if a small change in something affects another, of course, we have differentiation, and therefore we have a differential equation. So let's assume that we have a jungle out there, and there's a rabbit, and there's a lion, all right? And they have lots of kids, so there's a whole population of rabbits and lions. Now, we know that the rabbits feed the lions because they provide the food. So as the rabbit population is going to increase, we expect that the lion population increases because then it means they get more food to thrive. But if the lions feed so much on their rabbits, they start to de decrease. And once they are decreasing, the lions are going to keep also start starving, and therefore their population reduces. Now, that is the whole thing in ecology. So as competing for natural resources. Now, another one. Let us assume that um, the simplest one, I have a cold, right? And I come to school, and I keep sneezing. Naturally, people in the class are going to get the cold. How does it spread through the class? One of our very common models is what we call the SIR model. It models this as a, as a set of differential equations. So the S says that in the class, everybody is susceptible to cold. Everybody can get a cold. Now, so since we are all susceptible, some will definitely get infected, and that becomes the I. After infection, you recover, which is the R. So then, we have these three, and we actually model them in, respect to in relation to time. Now, there can be a further one that says that after recovery, you become successful again, so we don't get immune to it, because, of course, we don't get immune to everything. And then we have these set of equations to play out. Now, 2014, how many people were in SS by then? Or you were in primary school, right? Or GSS? Now, if you remember, we had this whole Ebola outbreak in West Africa where a lot of people were dying. Now, mathematicians and scientists use a variation of this model to model how fast this was going to spread. And really, it was quite accurate in short term period, because of course, this is going to be short term. Now, let's extend this further, because of course, Ebola had one other thing. It wasn't just we in a confined space, but people started migrating, so someone from Sierra Leone goes to Liberia, goes to Ghana, goes to all these places. So they actually had a spatial movement, and therefore we get a spatial epi epidemiology. Epidemiology says the spread of infectious diseases. Of course, there's computer vision. Now, this is one place where I work. Now, everybody talks about robots, robots. Now, there are robot games, there are robot competitions. How do robots see? Now, robots are trying to see like humans see. But I sit down here and I can count how many people I'm seeing in this room. How do I teach a robot to do that? Because these are things robots must be able to do. Identify things, count things, analyze situations. How do you do that? Given that, well, we just see we humans take sight for granted. But robots don't. Because if I take a picture, things just change. I can see things, but how do these things work out for a robot? Now, so as far as mathematicians are concerned, your picture is nothing more than a function, f of x. But in this case, because it's a picture in x and y, it says f of x, y. And at every f, x, y point, we have a value, which is the value of f of x, y. So if I can analyze this mathematically with all my differentiation, integration, statistical stuff, I can make sense of whatever is in there. I can count, for instance, the yellow uh, groups over here, the yellow cluster over here, and say how many yellows are there, so I can count the yellow students. This is how these things work. So this also in involves a lot of math. Now, don't forget, the world is no more stratified. The, the world is actually um, in a way interrelated. So everything now becomes interdisciplinary. You don't just talk math, but you talk math in relation to a lot of things. So this one tells you we use math and computers and statistics and sometimes physics to do that. Now when I was during my master's, I ha we had this research group called the Image Processing Group that had that. So we had groups from the hospital, groups from the computer science department, the mathematics department, and the statisticians, and even the radiologists from the hospital and all the surgery guys. Now, why? Because they have lots of images. MRI, X-ray, CT, mammography, PET, they were all the, all the big, big uh, initials. And they have 
large images. Now, today, if you go to Australia, you go and take that scan, you have to go back to the doctor, and he looks at it and then says, oh, well, this is not so clear. You go back and try it again and come back. And then you go and you take a different part of the body. Now, if we have these sort of concepts, it means I can take this whole picture, reconstruct the human body. Instead of you going back, we take that thing, break it up, and see what the problem is, where it is, and it's done. And this is pointing the area called um, virtual surgeries in other countries. Unfortunately, in Ghana, we don't even have the equipment, right? Now, because of that, the hardware manufacturers, uh, NVIDIA, AMD, Intel, they're actually manufacturing hardware for these things. Now, they have the core processes that are actually handling machine learning, computer vision, robotics, image processing. Now, they even have NVIDIA as the drive core processor, which is basically for vehicle automation. Now, all these things come up with some very big things. Data. Data rules our world. You start reading online and you are told data is the new commodity. Not gold, not oil. University of Pennsylvania has a data center called the Pennsylvania Data Center. Last year alone, they made about $13 billion selling data. Data everywhere, sensors, traffic, cameras. How do we work with this data? Do we call somebody and say, oh, yeah, take a look at this. Can you go through all the pictures and see what you're coming up with? Not really. We have to, in a way, model to automatically determine what is happening from there. Now you go to oceans, and they have what you call buoys, with sensors that are actually reading atmospheric parameters. There are satellites in the air reading atmospheric parameters, reading, in fact, looking for aircraft every second. There are satellites looking on the earth, looking at what is happening on the water, on land. There are satellites looking at our forests, seeing how fast these are degrading. There are satellites, in fact, I have this data that is uh, about 12 gig. That essentially is a historical view of the world's temperature, climate parameters. That's a lot of data. Now, question becomes, how do you work with this data? How do you do that? A lot of us, now, Excel, let me take Excel. Excel is great. I know you've all used Excel before, right? ICT. Or you've not even seen Excel before. Oh, so Excel is a spreadsheet program from Microsoft. But it's used Windows and Word. So Excel is used for the spreadsheet part. Now, people have, in a way, tried to use Excel to do some of their math and their modeling. Problem, Excel can only take two million rows of data. What if I have 24 million? I tried opening data with Excel. It kept opening, 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 so and said, well, I've reached my limits. There's nothing I can do. Sort it out yourself. Basically, that's what it meant. Now, so people are looking at ways to do this, to work with large data. You have 24 million rows of data, 100 million rows of data. You need to make sense of these. Now, don't forget, data is just numbers and texts. You have, are you going to really look through all this and say, let me count how many times this, view, this, this value occurs? No. So essentially, applied mathematicians are looking to programming to help them solve some of these things. Because if we can program, then the program makes sense of all these things and gives us results. We don't need to go through all these things anymore. And that is where we're moving to. Now, that is why mathematicians are almost everywhere. I talk about all these things. Now, there is, for instance, computational archaeology. Now, everybody says archaeology is just an art. Well, it's not. Can we look at what is happening there, apply some computational tools, what is in the ground? For instance, can I use some imaging device to actually read what is there and make sense of the, separate, the different striations of the earth? It is possible. So I want to I want to look at some of these things and show you some of, some of the things that we do with these. So another one is computational musicology, music. 
I'm sure all we think is, well, I, I can just take a trumpet and blow, right? I can just take a keyboard and just press the key, right? What happens when you do that? You get sound. What is sound? <laughs> Maybe. But what is what do you call it's not just it's noise it's noise it is random values so in the past um, maybe some of a lot of you were not old then when you used to have the analog tv you know when it started at 5 a, 5 p.m before then you stand on tv all here is with the black and white dots and running all over the place now, that was noise. Because there is nothing, noise takes over. Noise is just that uniform, random values. Now, but sometimes this can corrupt other things. But if there, if there is no noise, you hear the sound of the key that you pressed. Now, what is sound? Sound is a wave. So let's talk about that. This. Forget about it. But this just says that if, for instance, I put, I drop a stone in water, I disturb it, right? You see the ripples everywhere. Now, these ripples move away from the stone, or where it was dropped. But at a point, it will stop. This says that the disturbance in time is related to the space. So at a certain point, it's going to stop, but it's going to keep reducing. So for us, this bit here is less than one. Now, if we solve this, we get this. Now, I know this one you all know, sine cause summation. But what does it mean? This says, well, so this is a space and this is a time value. I'm talking about a wave, but as I said, sound is wave. So in the same way, if I take, let's take your flutes, and I blow the flutes. Now, air is all around us, but it is moving uniformly. Now, when the air picks up, you hear the sound of air. <sighs> now, if the air is uniform around me and I take my flute and I blow, what do I do? I blow air into the flute. Now, because of that small space, it disturbs the air around me, and that is the noise I hear, the disturbance of the air. Now, but this thing here would sort of reduce gradually and stop. Now, in the same way, if I take my keyboard, my organ, not the one that you put battery in, right? The, the piano itself. Now, it has a lot of copper wires in there. Every key you press basically disturbs a wire. And the wire vibrates, disturbing the air around it. Now, the thicker the wire, the more low tone or low frequency that you hear. The thinner the wire, the higher the pitch of your sound, the higher the frequency of your sound. Now, so we can use this to model sound, essentially. Now, in the same way with the flute, if I press certain buttons, I push air out more through a thinner space, and therefore I get a higher pitch. Now, this accounts for all the pitch things that you hear, that you, that you get on the, on the flute. The different holes pushing air out in different speeds, and therefore disturbing the air on it more. So I want to look at this. So this one says, in that case, how I disturb air to create music is based on these. These are the frequencies. Now, so this is the C frequency, 440. Then everything else has its own frequency. Now, but you note that what it says A4 and A5 is just A4 times 2. Now, that is just another C. So I start and I get to the second C. The second C is a higher pitch of the first C. So basically, it's a double the frequency. It's a multiple, instant multiple of frequency. In music, that's what we call an octave. So somebody says, sing an octave higher. It's just that. So I want to look at that. Hmm? Okay. So this is just that. This is uh, the sine with the 440. Now, you know that sine 2 pi at means that a is the frequency, right? So in this case, 
440 is the frequency. I just create what you call an array, a long file, and I, and I get that bit from it, and I just play that sign, that sign with frequency of 440. I get in from. All right. I don't know if you can hear this one. Now, so that is basically me playing that file I should, me running that file I showed to you on my PC to create a sound. Now, I have another one here that I call so far. So all the frequencies that I showed to you. I'm just playing those frequencies, all right? So let's see how that goes. So it's just me playing sound or playing sign curves. So again, it's just sign curves. Now, let's take a last one. This one, so what happens? Now, you realize that in our solution of differential equation, it's a summation of sign curves, right? And I told you, if I have integer multiples, I get higher frequencies. The same thing playing out here. So essentially, I am adding integer multiples to my original sound and playing them. So that is that. So basically we can make all the music that we want from just that. Now, this is data. Now, this was from a research that was conducted by Noguchi. So, in this data, we had about 60 respondents, right? Now, half of them were hookworm positive. Half of them were hookworm negative. So, they had a hookworm in them. Half of them didn't have them. Now, those bits were actually, again, half of them being children, half of them being adults. So, each, for each of the children group, or each of a child group, there was half of them with hookworm, half not. And for the adult group, we had the same thing. So we have, and what happened was that we actually tagged them with GPS loggers for 10 days. Now, these GPS loggers works out that every five seconds, it read their position. So at the end of the 10 days, you have their movement for every five seconds for 10 days. Now, when we put them together, we had about 2 million rows of data. Yeah, that's it. 2.15 million rows of data. And I get this. So in there, we have the respondents. We had, for instance, the time, the longitude and latitude, and the elevation, all these things. Now, imagine you're going through 2.1 million records to see, oh, where was this person? Where was that person? Well, that becomes a bit of work. So data science says, well, we need to actually look at this, analyze this, and actually show a result, show something about it. So for instance, this is a typical slide of this data. Now, this data was on the, on the Kintampo road. So you see Kintampo somewhere down there, and then the road going up north. And then this was the village which we tagged. So the question becomes, well, what were they doing? So from this data, we can actually analyze their movement patterns. for a typical day and see how it plays out. So this is these people from, so at the top here, we see the time, so 725, 735, so every five minutes we're actually seeing how they move and you realize that 
They go everywhere. Now, our job is to analyze these movements and basically see, is there a relation between their movement patterns and their hookworm infection rate? So is there some, because of course we know hookworm lives in the soil. So is there some parts of the soil that are infected that we can actually look at and say, well, because again, we learned that most of them actually like to walk barefooted. So we need to look at that to see what happens. And so some of our preliminary results, this is the last thing, don't worry. Some of our preliminary results are seen here. So essentially, we had black, black uh, triangles for positive patients and uh, sort of crosses for negative patients. And so we actually, again, look at the, the percentage or proportion of positives and negatives that were at particular locations at different points in time. And we come up with this grid. So basically, we divide into grid. If there are a lot of positives on the particular grid, we can go back there, take soil samples, and analyze them for what is happening. So we actually move further to see. So for instance, this bit here is a negative. We don't really need negatives. But this bit here is a positive. That is, in fact, a very high positive ratio to negative ratios. And again, they have a lot of the respondents that are positive being over there. So these are places that we want to look at to see what happens. So these are some of the things we do. And this is where mathematics plays out. So Mathematics is not just about the classroom. We love the classroom, but we love to apply math to real world problems to see how we can solve, solve, them, solve them really. And being interdisciplinary means that I can work with people like my friends here to see how things work out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shwenga. Thank you. At this point, we're going to open up for questions and answers. So please, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. The mic will come to you and then doctor can address your questions. So please, it's time for questions and answers. Anybody with a question? Yeah, I'll shut down. Please raise your hand and then the mic will come to you. Okay, we have a hand. Oh, good morning. Uh, I appreciate the presentation so much. In fact, it has given a lot of insight to data science and computer science. But I want to draw your attention to something. When you were talking, you could see you were having negative reactions from the top there. Not, I, I'm not convinced. Not that they don't, but we don't appreciate computer science and data. It's not our fault. Now, your position as a doctor, looking at the reaction over there, you have not more than 200 people in the room. How are you going to make them understand that data rules the world and that they should get into programming? How will you make it interesting to them? Thank you. All right. Thank you for that. So, I know that right now the government is talking about robotics in countries. Now, but really, the whole idea of data science was because of that, and I hope that I can get some people interested in that whole thing. Now, the idea of data science was essentially to get people interested in the data that they themselves generate. So the initial plan was to get people like lawyers trying to program. Now, I know that if you've done computer science and mathematics, my 101 people, how are you? <laughs> now, that is what happens. Now, I don't doubt it. My, one of my mentors said, math is a challenging course. So people say math is a difficult course. There are two different things. And your bre? Oh yeah, your bre. See, you don't have a lot of people doing math anyway, but we want to get people interested. Now, for instance, in the math department, one of the courses I introduced was uh, computation mathematics. Right? <coughs> Sorry. Now, so in the second year, our job is to teach you to program in Python. Why Python? It's a very easy programming language, close to human understanding, so you can understand it. So you come to math, second year, now we actually made it two semesters, so I'm going to teach you next semester and a semester after that, student to program. 
Now, we teach this programming in relation to data science. So at the end of the semester, you have a one month long project where you actually analyze some data I gave to you. So last semester, they looked at, for instance, um, some data on the Ebola thing I was talking about, some data on ship ves vessels at sea, and uh, I gave them data on the, when the Ghana city, when we go, what the Ghana city, the exchange rate from that time, 2007 to date, every single day, you're supposed to make sense of those things. And it was a one month long thing. Now, the idea was because it's practical, it forms a huge chunk of their grades. So then it was 30% because I want you to learn. And you work together and present it. Now, this is how we can get people interested in data by making them use data. I can come and talk all I want, but if you don't get to see it enough, you don't really care. So the job is actually to get people interested in it. Hopefully, we might try to see if we can actually target secondary schools because Python is very easy to program. Yeah, well, I was having a sort of a communication with a friend who wanted to look at the primary school because I feel that I can actually teach programming to kids if it's not about math. Teach them to code, to solve problems with coding. Again, Python and these, because again, we have Lego or Logo, sorry. Logo is one of these pictorial programming languages for kids. You can teach your kids to do that. Because now kids use computers to just serve, my son uses computers to just watch football. You know, but this is something that they can do. And I'm hoping that, well, it's four years now, five, six years, we can get to see how these things work out when it's five or six years. But we know that targeting them at a lower age always does that, get their mind tuned into that to solve problems because they come to the second to the university, it's a bit more difficult. Because now, I have students who said, oh, me, I can't program. I said, you have to have the passion. I got there, in fact, I started because I started reading books on programming when I finished SS. And I just was enthused by the fact that I can teach a computer to do something. So then I got interested in it. So yes, by targeting them at a lower age, solve problems, then we can build on from there. And again, by we those who generate data. For instance, we have all these our students here. Do we have data on performance in time? These are things we can use to actually even enhance the performance of our students. What are we doing wrong? How can we do better? But Again, it comes down to this. Mathematics, as somebody said, I offer, it needs you to be dedicated. I know people who have been to school uh, and they say, well, I got a get A in WASI. In the university, it's a whole different ball game. <laughs> if you are not willing to learn, you don't come. There are students who come. I don't know what happens to your bells that are told for you in the secondary school, but you get to university, you're still a person to toll bells for you. We don't toll bells. You manage your own time. So you have to make time to learn. But a lot of people come, finish class, go and sit down, come back the next time, and they wonder why they are failing. You need to be able to continue this, your drive, that you had in the secondary school in the university. That is important. And you see, you need to challenge yourselves. That is important. I learned new things by challenging myself. I really didn't stick to the core stuff, because I was interested in it. We would try to make it interesting for you, but you need to challenge yourselves to work at it. Then, of course, you'll be successful. None of us like to see students who come and then are failing the university. No. But again, it is not on a silver platter. Because every university strives to attain the standard the world gives it. And therefore, nobody will give you easy questions that somebody else will see outside and say, oh, is this what you're doing in university? So you need to sit up and work hard. Then you can succeed. Hmm? Okay. One last chance for another question. Anybody else? There's a hand. Okay. So the mic will come to you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Kwamche Dankwa. And Doc, when you were talking, you made mention of uh, two aspects of mathematics, being the pure math and the applied math. Yeah, I do appreciate that. 
but I think as a country, there is something that we are losing focus on. That is the mathematics education. Because it is from what mom was saying, I, I, I just need your take on it. From what mom was saying, it is the mathematics educators who, who arouse the interest of the students right from the scratch. So if you are not building more on mathematics education, we are always looking at the applied and analysis aspect. That is the pure math. Then we end up putting fear in the student because most of the things that you, you said are the scratch. It's hardly they, are, they, they, will, they will be able to apply. Uh -huh. So I think as a country, we should put more effort on the mathematics education. And again, I'll be very happy if you put your take on it. Thank you. Okay. So my take on it is simple. I assume that all the mathematics educators are mathematicians. If you are not, then of course we are not doing anything. So I always expect that in the investors that are teaching education, you focus on mathematics for the educators as well. That way, you see, if you're an educator and you are not pushing the math, you're not seeing the math itself in use yourself, how do you transfer that to your children? So I'm not separating mathematics education as a different aspect because I feel it's an integral part of the mathematics. I'm an educator, but a mathematician. So yes, I know what happens in the, in the secondary schools where you have somebody who has done biology teaching mathematics. That is the difficult, that is the problem. Because he doesn't have the passion, doesn't understand it himself, and therefore, these kids don't get it. If you want to teach mathematics, know the mathematics. Because the worst thing you can do is tell a child that A plus B all squared is A squared plus B squared because you understand mathematics. So, I'm not separating them. You should be a mathematician. And now our universities are channeling out a lot of mathematics graduates. And this is what I hope will learn to, of course, go into the education sector. And I hope that the government understands that those who are teaching their kids to the secondary school are as important as we are so that it affects their remuneration. Because, of course, we need to attract people into the field. Mathematicians, that's what I mean. I was watching a video of a geometry course for high school. And the person teaching that video was teaching high school, but had a PhD. You get it? That is it. We need the educators, but they are mathematicians as well. And as I said, we are all working together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Aram. Thank you very much for your time with us. You're welcome. And so once again, thank you all for participating in our mentorship session today. Our mentorship session for this year is brought to you by Goyle. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Here's innovation from Goyle that takes you further. New Gold Super Synthetic 5W20 and 5W30 tubes have been expertly crafted with the latest in liquid engineering technology, highly advanced for modern engines, prolongs oil change intervals, save you fuel, clean, protect and enhance engine performance. The way engines work has become complex and Goyle has innovated to stay ahead with expertly crafted lubricants that work excellently with all petrol and diesel engines of today. New Goyle Super Synthetic 5W20 and 5W30 News. Innovation that takes you further. Goyle. Good energy.